open up now for a round of comments on the last two books. Yep. Uh, hi, James Cohn from Transparency International's Defense and Security Program. I'm wondering, within the research on the extractive industries and development, what role did you find that multinational corporations were playing? And what role do you think they should play? And what would they be willing to play? And <laughs> <laughs> um, Canada's CETA is now kind of taking up that role of integrating uh, private uh, companies with civil society, with them being the med mediator in between to a lot of pro and anti comments and if you're aware of that program and have any comments to how that would apply to this research. Thanks very much. Sheila. Uh, thank you. Uh, did you look at aid as well as uh, mining and oil? Because certainly in economics it has the same distorting effects on production. It has the same effect of weakening institutions. Does it also increase conflict? Increase profit. <laughs> I'm Pilar Domingo from ODI. Um, Rosemary, just to pick up the question of agency, how, mm -hmm. given the weight of this histor these historical and institutional legacies, how can agency change pathways? And I think also, inevitably, about the comparison with Bolivia, where agency took a very different form at different periods, 52 and more, maybe more recently. And Thanks, Pilar. Any more <coughs> questions at this point? Yeah, okay, yeah. Um, I read uh, 15 years ago, you wrote about, uh, Francis um, wrote about um, uh, Kenya, um, Ga U Uganda, and Sri Lanka comparing political and economic oppression. And then uh, five years ago, or seven years ago, you have coined the new phrase, uh, horizontal inequalities. And um, anthropologists have been analyzing what has been happening in Sri Lanka for the last 65 years from the time of independence. And they have been saying it is a matter of internal colonialism. So that is its political oppression going into economic, social, cultural, and even now environmental oppression because the army of occupation is damaging their um, environment, cutting down the trees and sending it to the south and scooping out the sand from the shores and sending it to the south and um, all a uh, lot more. Um, so this, uh, if it is, uh, if horizontal inequalities are uh, left to go on for decades, then it creates more and more uh, problems. Now the army of occupation has taken over all the fishing, farming, and economic activities, and the people there are deprived of uh, all those things. So if you leave it to HIs for no, only DFID, uh, it is not going to be sold. <laughs> FCO, FCO is very responsible for that because they make all the decisions and they make all the pronouncements and then uh, mislead and then I don't know what DFID will be able to do on that. Thank you. We'll take that one after the first three questions on the uh, on Rosemary's book. Rosemary. Right, yes, thank you. Um, yes. Um, um, the, the we weren't looking directly um, principally at multinational corporations, but obviously they're very much part of the story. Um, I think um, what we find is that multinationals can be all things to all men and women. They're very, very different roles depending on a lot of circumstances, but um, over the long haul, historically a very negative role. Um, but in a sort of sense, um, they didn't have to be particularly evil. They were just there and governments thought that in order to bring them in, they had to um, push policies in a very laissez-faire right-wing direction. They d nobody, people didn't typically test the boundaries very much there, but the, the, they were all part of that story. Um, I think in the more contemporary period, well in our, as they came into our um, qualitative evidence and what have you, um, really all kinds of stories. Um, I mean, the most extreme perhaps is um, a gold and copper mine in the um, mountains of Peru in Espinar. Um, where um, when it was owned by BHP Billiton, mm. an extraordinary positive experience um, of um, uh, Oxfam Australia developed um, an institution called um, an ombudsman for, for mining. Um, and the person, the ombudsman was a remarkable woman called, called Ingrid, who was um, talking of leadership. Her particular role was very important. Anyway, um, I, I, um, 
Fox of Australia decided to take top executives for an educational experience to live with mining families and just see the reality from the other side. And the mining, the director of the Peruvian mine in Espinar, Tintaya, um, went on one of these programs, three weeks to India, li living with a, um, a, work, a worker's family in India. And it was like the road to Damascus. It was total conversion. He came back say, and assembled his, his um, staff and said, we cannot go on as we have been going on. We have to change. They were in the middle of, at that time, very unproductive attempts to, of, um, to deal with a, a very rebellious, much abused set of local communities who really felt, very with very good reason, incredibly abused. Um, and he turned that around. He really did. And he did engage in, in negotiation. And he was famous for being seen walking all around these communities, just talking to people. He really engaged in dialogue. Um, and the result was a very generous settlement on the part of the com com company, um, both to the communities and to the local municipality in a fund. Um, it then all went sour after that. I mean, this is so important because it's what is not within the province of the, the multinational companies that mm. is very important as well. Um, the local structures, the infrastructure, all the rest of it just weren't there mm. for this money to be used productively. Um, and with a, the sort of accountability <coughs> that you know, reasonably the com company had to ask, and it didn't get spent. And it was incredible frustration, and eventually riots all over again, and um, the mine taken over, and the mayor hel hold, held hostage, and so forth. Eventually BHP gave up, I think, for many reasons, not just the frustration, but maybe the frustration too, and Extrata took it over. And since then it's been awful, you know, mm. just classic abuse, abusive behavior, I'm afraid, by a, a big multinational. Um, and um, at present, the situation is incredibly tense, as many of you, quite a lot of you probably know. It's very, very bad. So um, companies really can play all kinds of roles. But I really did, you know, I think I saw from that the potential to play a good role. In occasionally, there can be companies that really honestly do want to try. But then I saw the tragedy of how much is outside of their control in the, that story. So that, that's perhaps the problem. And like I don't know anything about CEDA, and the chair is looking at me, so I'm just go on. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, um, aid, w it would be just such a fascinating book to do, Sheila. Shall we do it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sh it would be different because I'm, I s I'm identifying very specific characteristics of extractives which don't apply to aid. Um, but I think, th and I, uh, in fact, actually, I haven't got any real case studies of aid directly leading to conflict in the different countries I, I've worked on, but it would be a really important question to raise. I thank you for raising it. Pilar, yes, agency can change pathways. I believe this so deeply, but as you watch it over time, it just makes you very discouraged, doesn't it? I, um, I mean, particularly the Bolivian story, which you know so very, very well, where you know, there was a, an amazing revolution led by um, mine workers and tre tremendous <coughs> strength behind that, but then it just dissipates into the sand for lack of the right institutions for them to be able to use and and the strength of of elite groups which can still move in and and, and manipulate things it's a really really sad story so um but i'm i'm really not a determinist i'm just seeing so but i do see so much how history shapes things but it doesn't determine them and i'm so completely convinced that agency can change it um and the fact that I've got very negative stories so far out of Latin America hasn't discouraged me at all. I'll go on looking for positive agency. Okay. Thanks very much, Rosemary. Alina, do you want to, do you have anything? No. You don't, nothing, so at this point. Okay. We've got, yeah, sure, sure. There's also, if I can just add, there's a question coming online from uh, Jonathan Evershed at ILO. No one has talked about those on the top of the pyramid. If reducing horizontal inequality requires redistribution, how do you persuade the formerly dominant that they haven't lost? So. Well, that's a very good question. Let me first say a little bit about aid, and it's indirectly relevant to Sri Lanka. We did do a, a review of aid, which doesn't really come into any of these books. But aid is very often complicit in <coughs> worsening horizontal inequalities. With, for example, Rwanda, Burundi, Sri Lanka, where the aid over many years, not just uh, during a particular crisis, but over many years has supported one group rather than another. Um, I think partly because they tend to work with the governments and the governments want to support one group rather than another, and partly because this is not an issue that is built into their consciousness 
And so they're not worried about it. And so they just go ahead and, you know, the capital is a good place to put money and it seems like it's an efficient thing to do. And they, you know, try and put a lot of money into northern Nigeria and it's sort of very fruitless. And so it, it tends to happen. So I think that that's one very important reason why it needs to be built into the aid. Not, again, we come back to do no harm, you know, that you may not be correcting things, but at least you correct your own actions. Um, and I, I can't answer the Sri Lanka question, but certainly DFID can't answer it either. You're absolutely right. And it's a deeply distressing and deeply political situation in which the international community, if they're going to do anything, should come together through the UN and so on at the Foreign Office and take action. I think it's a terrible situation. Um, one thing we haven't talked about is correcting political inequalities. We've been very focused on socioeconomic. And one of the things that contributes to political inequalities is sometimes is simply our unthinking um, ad advocacy of multi-party democracy. Because you have a majority group and that majority group is going to be winner take all, like in the Westminster model particularly, and that it imparts a very big <coughs> horizontal inequality. And if you're in an ethnic society in which people don't change ethnicity, it's durable. That means that one, if one group's bigger than the other, that group's got permanent power over the other. Mm -hmm. And the only way the other group can ever get any power is actually through some sort of violence. And so what we're talking about really is a different sort of political system in which power is much more shared. And we think about that a bit in terms of federalism, uh, which helps, decentralization, which helps, and then there are all sorts of systems of sharing power at, at the top also. So there's a whole lot of things, but it's the system that we're preaching as a, as a community at the moment is one that is blind to these issues, just as much as the economic system, and, and that's very important. And that comes, at, well, the top of the pyramid question, very good question. Um, yes, it does involve redistribution. Of course, you can sort of get out of this if you say there's going to be growth and everyone's going to gain, but you, know, you confront the reality and it involves redistribution. And let me just reflect briefly on two cases. One is Northern Ireland, where uh, the British government and the EU were tremendously instrumental in a huge redistribution. Uh, the horizontal inequalities were at the heart of the conflict, and these were very largely corrected through a lot of series of policies of direct and indirect type. But the Protestant community, which has lost, is in a, sen is in a state of seething resentment, and th this erupts from time <coughs> to time into some sort of violence. So it is a very tricky thing to do. And I think one has to accept this. And then I might turn to Malaysia, where the Chinese <coughs> community um, has, was much the richest. And over time, the policies have reduced the inequality. They haven't eliminated it by any means, but they've reduced it quite substantially. And the Chinese are also disenfranchised, basically, politically. And they, too, are, are resenting things, but they're not in a position to do very much uh, about it, so they're not doing very much <coughs> about it. But it is a, a really serious issue, a very important issue. And one of the things I feel from both those two examples <coughs> is first, obviously, you have to introduce the policy sensitively. But secondly, you do need to have what we sort of loosely call integrationist policies, policies to try and bring communities together and to feel less strongly that they're part of one community rather than the other. And in neither of those two cases has there been any really effective policy in that direction. I don't know how easy it is to have policies like that. Um, they're not that often tried, but this is a, an, uh, another research area that we would like to do. Thanks very much, Francis. I mean, do you have anything well, you want maybe, to add? Well, maybe quick on, on the Malaysia and Northern Ireland case. I think it's important that the redistribution in those cases was enabled that the, the, the richer group, the, the Chinese in the Malaysian case, and, and the Protestants in the, in the Northern Ireland case were not losing out in absolute terms. And that clearly, if you have therefore good growth rates ongoing, you can at least ensure that they in absolute terms increase their wealth. And that creates a much more, a broader support for the policies in, uh, that you want to implement if there's a relative dis uh, redistribution uh, in those terms. Uh, and maybe a an, an last point on, on the, uh, the political horizontal inequality and, and the way to address it is clearly um, we cannot uh, underestimate how difficult that is. I mean, there are many, many scholars have been thinking about constitutional design, uh, just think about the Leipards and, and, and the Horowitzes and the complexities of those things, uh, of, the, of the, the, the proposals they've come up with and that they didn't always work out as one expected them to work out uh, when, when they were thought of. Um, so, 
But that doesn't necessarily, uh, we get back to that thing that, but that in itself is not enough not to think about it and to start trying to do something. Because in the end, the, w the situation might be worse. Because violence, as we know, is, is the worst inhibitor of development. So in that sense, we need to start continuing to think about that. And I think that is a clear message that, that is linked to, to the work we've been doing at Crease. Maybe we can start with that. Well, thanks very much. Um, I'll just finish by reiterating that um, I think the work of the Crease Center. Sorry. Can you, can I say something? Yeah, sure. No, of course you can. Yeah. I think this issue of, of democracy and winner take all is really important. And what you were saying, Francis, earlier about uh, whether or not it's possible to find mechanisms that can nurture multiple different identities but th that reinforce each other rather than undermine each other. And I think the issue that we were talking about here about constitutional <coughs> design, I mean, if you have, the, the problem is that I there's no easy solution there because presumably the idea of having winner take all systems is that it can actually help to foster um, identities that are greater than just your own ethnic one. Um, but that doesn't help if, if, um, if ethnic groups are, are quite um, uh, located something geographic, somewhere geographically. So I think this is a real, real challenge. And just in terms of the redistribution, I mean, I'm thinking, for example, of the astonishing case of, of Guatemala when they had their peace process and how really extensive that process was. And at the end of the day, how little there has been in terms of altering power structures mm -hmm. there. Um, so you see how durable these things really are mm -hmm. and how difficult it is. Um, so I think the challenge really is to figure out how to foster identities that can be overlapping and um, mutually reinforced. Actually, Chris, can I also no. just add something to that very, very quickly as well? Um, I mean, I think my, my view in terms of really thinking about things that can be done proactively is, is that you can, you can take areas, particular areas where there is a, and find gateways where there is a real opportunity, where there might be, um, there might be a, a, political in, it might be a political imperative, the economic development opportunities, and you know, really strong grassroots organisations can kind of come together. And, and I think donors can have a really important role in supporting some of that through both their understanding and the research, but also through you know, pilot initiatives. And then, and then somehow bringing that together with different actors that might be engaging in that area, you know, through you know, large-scale economic projects that might be coming on board, you know, talking with you know, multinational, the private sector, actually, you know, as you say, has a really important role in thinking about how the benefits might be distribu distributed to different organisations over time and perhaps bringing in you know, marginalised groups into, into um, you know, developing opportunities through those programmes and things. And I, think, I think that's where we've seen you know, areas where there's been really significant traction on, on addressing some of the horizontal inequalities. Um, but it's not always that straightforward, which I think we've probably picked up on today. Thanks very much, Charlotte. Uh, thanks to all six presenters. Um, and, well, presenters and discussants. Um, I think you did a great job under challenging circumstances <laughs> given the range of the material. The last thing I want to say is just I think this was work um, through the Cree Centre that changed the way development talked about, understood and changed the languages that we use to understand these things. So I, I just want to reiterate the comments that have been made that I think this is um, a very important body of work. Um, in the early 2000s, the focus in the major agencies was all on building formal state structures, and particularly, obviously, security and other elements. And this was really significant work in highlighting the underlying <coughs> dynamics of conflict and changing the way in which it's discussed. So we were delighted to host this session, and many thanks to all of the presenters. So thank you very much. <laughs>